Thank you, Chris and choir, orchestra. I love all that music brings to us this time of year. Looking so forward to uh, next week at our first family Christmas, a time of celebration, a uh, time of good food. Uh, you know what the Bible says, whenever three or more are gathered in his name, eat something. And uh, so we're, we're going to do that next week and enjoy the time of fellowship together. Look so forward to that. Uh, let me say a word or two. Uh, first of all, to remind you that after our service today uh, in Heritage Hall, there's going to be a reception, shower, greeting, whatever you want to call it, for the cold peppers. As you know, in just a few weeks, we are going to welcome uh, Miss Emerson Culpepper into the world. And uh, that's exciting. That's the first staff baby that's been born in this church in a long time. So we're excited about that. And, uh, and keep in mind that just a few weeks later, uh, we'll be welcoming uh, the Hunt Felkies, the baby that as of yet has no known gender or name. That's a, that's a rarity in these days. But we're saving the surprise uh, in the weeks ahead. So uh, I want you to know my staff is committed to church growth. I mean, they really are. They, are, they, they will do whatever it takes. I, I asked Phil and Carol what they thought about that, and uh, it didn't, didn't seem to resonate as much with them. So uh, yeah, it's good. But we're thrilled. Let me also take a moment before we dive in. Uh, to echo Chris's sentiment from earlier, 3 o'clock today in the Narthex uh, will be a service of hope. It's a very informal time, uh, but a very intimate time as we come together. We talk about uh, what it's like to go through difficulty at the holidays. I know my family story, the loss of our brother-in-law a few weeks ago. Uh, we know that's not alone. And uh, we also know that uh, there are other things besides death that bring difficulty uh, to this season. If that is part of your story, or the story of someone you know, and you'd like to pick up some, uh, some ideas and things that can be helpful to them, come share that with us at 3 o'clock today. And uh, for that, we will be grateful. We're continuing in our Advent as we begin to wander through. And uh, it is, we're calling it this year, as you see, St. Pete's Advent. And that's a little double entendre there, in that we are living in the city of St. Pete, uh, that's our home. That's where we're, where we're centered. Uh, but also, we're focusing on scriptures from St. Peter all the way through. Now, that seems a little odd because most of the time when we think about Peter, we don't think about him with Christmas. I mean, Peter doesn't show up till a long time after the wise men and the shepherds, right? When we talk about Peter, we tend to think about him more at the crucifixion and, and beyond than we do in the beginning. But when you begin to read his word, begin to read his letter, you really understand he understood the power of the incarnation of who Christ was and all that we come to celebrate. And the traditional themes of Advent show up in Peter's writing. So this year, it's a little different take. We're looking at uh, 1 Peter and his reflections back on uh, the themes of Advent. And you remember what last week we talked about hope. I said, uh, and I stand with it, you can live 40 days without food. Don't want to try that. You can live four days without water. You can live four minutes without oxygen. But you can't live four seconds without hope. That's that hope that carries us from where we are into the days ahead. The beginning of the Advent season is always a message of great hope. We move beyond that to the celebration of love. Next week with all the music and joy. And then as we gather on Christmas Eve to come in here in the morning, twice on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve morning when we talk about the fourth Sunday of Advent of peace. And then gather again that night with the coming of the Christ child where we'll light the Christ candle to be mindful of his coming. But today we are going to talk about joy. Talk about love, excuse me, everlasting love. And uh, you know, if you're going to write a song that makes a whole lot of money, uh, what's the one topic you can never go wrong with? Love. love. I mean, if I sit here, I can say, what's your favorite love song? They just pop out all over. Well, I'm a child of the 70s, and I remember the, the song. Y'all remember Everlasting Love? You do? You know, that's a, it's, a, it's a neat song. 
It, uh, it, was, it was by a one-hit wonder by the name of Carl Carlson, if you're a trivia person of that age, you may remember that, whose original stage name was Bad CC. That's deeply spiritual stuff, y'all. I've been thinking, where's Chris Culpepper here? I think from now on we're going to call Chris Bad CC. What do you think? Yeah. See if that takes. I, I, think, I think it works with him. Okay, but choir, I, I'm glad I've got you right here at my beck and call this morning because you're going to help me here, okay? Because there's that line, everlasting love. Do you know, you know that line? So all you got to do is just sing that with me. Let's try it. I always wanted to direct this choir. Here we go. I know you're not supposed to turn your back on the audience, but, you know, here we go. Everlasting love. Now, there's really deep spiritual lyrics to this song, okay? Uh, I won't go do all of them, but let's hit a few here uh, as we begin to look through it. My, my phone actually shifted. Uh, Open up your eyes, then you'll realize here I stand with my that's good. Y'all got to come. Okay, the second verse is all of us together here. This is deep, y'all. Don't tell the spirit to feel the, the depth of emotion. Need you by my side, girl, you'll be my bride. You'll never be denied. Everlasting love. Oh, man, y'all are good from the very start. Open up your heart. Be a lasting part of I tell you what, man, you guys got, give yourselves a hand on that one. That is, that's good. You can't hide a good tune, you know. Uh, old, old Carl had it right then. Later on, Gloria and Stefan did this. She did a version of that. Uh, you too. Sensing there was a spiritual theme in there somewhere, Bono picked it up. And you too even recorded it. So you get the, uh, you get the idea. We're talking today about everlasting love as a divine gift gift, that wonderful love that came down at Christmas, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. The love that is everlasting unto everlasting always was, always is, always will be. You've heard me say many times, if you believe that Jesus loves you, you do not believe enough. Jesus loves you no matter what. There's nothing that we can do to separate ourselves from that love. And in 1 Peter, as we look at the, uh, the text from the first chapter, in verse 22 and following, uh, hear the good word uh, as he begins to give this to us. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers... Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, uh, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For, and this should sound familiar to you from the text uh, that Braxton read for us earlier, all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. It stands forever. This passage begins to take us back to that picture of uh, everlasting love. We sing about it in the hymnals of the love that will not let us go. We find our rest in that kind of love. And as we begin to walk through it, we begin to get a picture here. Of, of what uh, Peter is trying to make sure we understand. And if you kind of look at the, the words uh, of, of asking the questions, well, when and who and how and why and how long? Those are the questions we're going to look at as we begin to wonder through this verse. Well, first of all, I want you to notice that the word love there is the word agaperos. Interestingly, it's exactly the same word for love that Jesus asked of Peter when he said to him, Peter, do you love me? Do you remember that? He says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter replied, what? You know I love you. And then Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, there's an interesting take on that, that, that uh, encounter that the Gospels gives us. As you know, there, there are three different New Testament words for love. 
agape, agape ros in here, is that self-sacrificing love. It is that godly love, Christ-like love, that puts, puts others above ourselves. Then there is the phileo, which is the a familial love. You know, you're my buddy. You're, you're my family. You're my peeps. Uh, you, 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 that's that's a, that kind of love. Yeah, I'm, I'm fond of you. Man, we, we got a great relationship. Then you, then you get eros, from which we get the romantic or the erotic love that, uh, that has that component of attraction and, and love tied to it. And it's three completely different words. So Jesus is asking Peter in that encounter, Peter, do you agape me? Do you, do you love me at that deep, deep level where you would just give everything of yourself out of that love? And Peter's response is, you're my buddy. I'm fond of you. I love you. Phileo, it's, it's kind of just going by him. But Peter is writing in retrospect, and as he begins to look at this, all of a sudden that word shows up in his teaching, and he gets it right. He gets it right when he says uh, that, that the word here is love that we are, uh, that we are called to. Now that you have been purified uh, yourselves by the obeying the truth, uh, then you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply. How do we do that? It comes to us through our relationship with God through Jesus Christ that makes us capable of loving one another. That we are capable of doing that. That makes it our, our very nature. It's because we have been born again. It's because we've been made new in him that puts within us the desire to do that and to live with that kind of love and to live with that kind of uh, expression uh, of that. That comes to us in salvation. You don't want to miss that. That there is that time in our life where we come to say, yes, Lord, I believe you are who you are. I believe, God, that you sent your son to this world to live, show us how to live, to die, and was, was, has risen again. And beyond that, I'm going to accept that as forgiveness of my sins, and I'm going to, as best I know how, follow you all the days of my life. And that puts us in that motion. It's, it's how do we begin to express that kind of love? It begins in our relationship. That it, uh, that it flows through us. And then who do we love? Well, let's take a look at the text as we begin to walk through that. Love one another. Let's just pause there for a minute. Uh, can you think of any other text in the Bible that talk to us about the call to love one another okay how about John 13 and 35 when it says by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another now it's easy for us to say how do we define ourselves as Christians by this they will know that you're my disciples if you're at church at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning right <laughs> No, okay, now that's important to be in church on Sunday morning. Don't, don't get me wrong. But how about uh, they will know you're my disciples if they know that you're really clear about what you believe and are really clear about how superior that is to everybody else in the world. Now, how come a lot of folks live like that? Uh, and they will know you're my disciples if you're proven right all the time. Now, the litmus test is love. Because God's very nature is love. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit. But understanding that we are called to love one another, that is a demonstration of our faith. And it, 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 throughout the, the epistles, uh, the, the thing that people would say, they'd look at the people within the, the fledgling church, and you know they were kind of suspect. You know, they, they were a group they weren't too sure about, but they would be legitimized by saying, see how they love one another. That, that is what gave their faith legitimacy. It's what gave their faith uh, the ability to, to really be understood and valued by people looking in. We love one another, and that love extends out beyond us. Jesus is pretty clear about teaching that. And then, uh, how do we do that? And it says to here in the, in the uh, NIV, 
to love one another deeply from the heart. Now, that word that is, it kind of takes, it takes one word and kind of makes a sentence out of it in this translation. It's a good translation. But the, the, the King James actually here uses a different word. Some of you may have that in your Bibles, where it says to love fervently. Okay? That may be one you're more familiar with. Now, the word fervently here is, uh, without belaying the point, it is a physiological term. Okay? It means that you, uh, you stretch your body to its absolute limit. Okay? Now, you guys know who I'm married to, right? I, I am married to a fitness queen, and she's, she's unbelievably fit, and she stays after me, and it's clearly not working. And, um, <laughs> but, but part of what I do to, to try to make it not be worse than this is, is I'll go to a workout. I'll go to a class. And usually, I'm, the whole time the class starts, can I confess to you? I'm working hard, I'm giving it all I've got, but there's a clock on the wall, and I know exactly 53 minutes after we start, it's going to stop, and it cannot get here quick enough. But somewhere along minute 51, when I'm ready to go, I'm done, there is just some blasted coach in the room, there's somebody there who goes, you didn't come this far to quit now. You push it, make it your last 30 seconds your best, and then you do that, and then you, you kind of fall out and die right there. But you take, it's, it's like those great theologians, the eagles, would say, you take it to the limit. One more time. We love so fervently that it tests the limits of our ability to love. Yet we stretch it there. That's the word picture that, that Peter is making sure we get, is that we, we carry it all the way to, to that level. It just takes everything we have. And can I tell you the truth? There are some people who press us a whole lot more than others to, than others to love. Am I right? There are some people it doesn't take a whole lot to love. Some people it takes a lot of work. You take it to the limit. You love with that fervency that takes it to absolutely all you have. Then why do we do it? We do it because we've been born again. We do it because it's our nature. We do it because the God who loves us lives inside of us and wants us to share that beyond us. You guys know we have great loves in our life and uh, we have two great sons. We have also traditionally had two fur babies. Uh, generally, along most of our married life. Right now, we have Dexter and Cotton. Uh, some of y'all have met them. Cotton is big. This is actually from our, our dogs that we had for years and years and years. Uh, on the top over there is, is, is probably my favorite dog I've ever owned. That is Obadiah. Uh, we called him Obi. He was named after uh, the prophet Obadiah, but also Star Wars fans. Are you ready for this week? Okay, he's also named after Obi-Wan Kenobi. Okay, do we have any children of the 60s here? Who was the arresting officer in Alice's restaurant? Officer Obi. Y'all should know that. Okay, so that's Obi. Obi is a mostly golden retriever who would run all day and leap through fields and run joyfully. And he would swim and he would retrieve. He would, hours on end, he would go back and do that. Now, right below Obi in, in our pickup there, which, by the way, they thought they owned, uh, is Boudreau. Now, Boudreau is, is an odd dog. Uh, Boudreau is half lab and half Sharpe. He looks kind of like Astro on the Jetsons. Uh, <laughs> I kept waiting any moment for him to look up and go, you know, oh, George. Um, Boudreaux was stocky, all muscle, built like a gigantic sausage with tiny little legs and little bitty feet that had no webbing in them. And, and he would long to go swimming with Obi, and he would go out there, and he would make it about five feet, and he'd turn back around, and he'd come back in this way. Now, why do I tell you about, uh, about uh, Boudreaux and, and Obadiah? Other than the fact that it just warms my heart even to see their picture all these years later. Uh, it's because of this. Why, was it, why couldn't Boudreaux 
do the things that Obi could do, he wasn't built for that. It wasn't his nature. He wasn't a retriever. He didn't retrieve. He loved. He guarded. I could tell you stories about the Sharpay in him, how that lived out. It was a beautiful thing. But he couldn't run fast. He couldn't run long. He couldn't swim. He couldn't retrieve. He couldn't do any of those things. It wasn't his nature. Then we look at folks in the world who, who don't know the love of God in their heart. And while certainly they're capable of uh, of being caring and being good and all those things, there is a depth of love that just does not come natural because they're not wired up that way. That only when we allow the love of God to operate deep in our heart, only when we let the one who is love live within us and live from us, does that truly happen? When our nature has been changed and the way we love others is a reflection of how we are wired up by the one who is love who lives in us. And if that's not your nature, that's not going to come. But if it is, that is the great call that we have. So that tells us the picture of the... the uh, the, the what to do and the, the who do we love and when we love and how we do it. We do it fervently. Why we do it? Because it's a part of our nature. And how long does it last? Well, the picture there is everlasting. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Have you ever been separated from anybody at a time when you really didn't want to be separated from them? You know what it feels like? Now, I'm going, I'm going to kind of whine a little bit. Not too bad, but a little bit. I, I, I shared my wife last week with our son and, uh, and daughter-in-law and grandbaby in Alabama. She was sick. They needed, she needed some gram love and some nursing, and she was there to take care of that. And uh, they got there. And in fact, here's a picture this week. It was taken. That is my beloved little Abigail meeting Santa Claus for the first time. And what you, what you don't know is what she's doing right now is she is saying to Santa Claus, I love Graham and I need her more than Pop does. Would you please let her stay with me a whole lot longer? And Santa delivered because the snowstorms came and all her flights had been canceled. She's still up there. Okay? Now, that, that's okay, but, but yesterday was our anniversary. Well, oh, everybody do that for me all at once. Oh, you know. I mean, we had planned like a, 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 a trip out to Salt Rock or, or something or, you know, Bella Brava. And um, what I got last night was Publix Rotisserie Chicken with the dogs. You know? I mean, Cotton and Dexter were happy. They were using peace for me, peace for you. But, you know, we, it, was, it was a great family meal, but it wasn't an anniversary. Because the snow of, you know, the, the snowpocalypse. Yeah, a little bit of snow goes a long way in the south. Uh, it, it, it shut everything down. It can, fly, it can fly out of Huntsville. can fly out of Atlanta. So she's still up there. God and Delta willing, I'll get her back tonight. Y'all pray, we hope. My point is this. There's just some things that can separate you from people that you can't control. Okay? But there's nothing that can separate us from the love of of God through Jesus Christ. How do we know that? We know the words of Paul in Romans in the 8th chapter. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who did what? Say it again. Okay. Uh, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That chapter that begins with no condemnation ends with no separation. There's nothing that can separate us from that kind of everlasting love. Not even our sin. Not, not even the things in life that hurt us and come down on us. There's nothing that, that separates us because he loves us. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more or love you less. And that is the beautiful picture of how love came down to us in the incarnation. 
in the birth of a baby in a manger where God says, I love my world so much, I'm sending my son to live and to die and to live again. And out of that, we've come to fully understand the nature of love is that love is God's nature. We sang that when we were children. You remember, praise him, praise him, all ye little children. Okay, I can now tell who was in Sunday school as a child and who was not. Okay? God is love. God is love. That is his nature. Okay? But it's not just his nature. It's his motive. It's God's motive for everything that he does is love. And it is the end result of the actions that God takes. Everything God does comes out of love. It's done in love, motivated by love, to spread his love. Now, why is it so important that we take this scripture apart and understand that? It's because that's the call for us. When love comes down at Christmas, our nature becomes love because the one who loves us so much is living within us. That our supreme motive in all things is love. It's not to be right. It's not, to, uh, it's not to, for greed. It's not to control. It's, not to, it's none of those things. It's to love. And then what we do lives that out. In just a moment, we're going to come to this table, which is the great symbol of the love that he has given to us. It is the reminder that he loved us so much that he sent his son who lived and died and lived again and brought us to this table. So this morning as we ponder the second Sunday of Advent, just let that rest on you a little bit. This is the picture of agape, sacrificing love, redeeming love, sustaining love, everlasting love. And as you share in that together, take it in. Taste it. Feel it. Experience it. Commit yourself to it. Because God loves you so much. Never miss that. Let's pray together. Father, as we prepare to come to your table this morning, remind us of what it was that brought you to this world, what it was that governed all of Jesus' actions upon this world, what it was that took him to the cross and kept him on the cross. It wasn't the nails. It was love. So, Father, just permeate our spirits with that. Let us just marinate in it, soak it in, and let it change who we are because of who you are in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask my servant team, folks, to come forward, if you would, to begin in the sharing of communion, the Lord's Supper being mindful of what he has done in us and through us and for us. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
of life for all of us broken because of his love take be ye all of it and in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Love 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take and drink you all of it. The scriptures tell us that when they completed that meal, they sang a song together. They went out into the Mount of Olives where things were put in motion to bring about the very thing that brings us redemption in the province of our life. This time we're going to stand together and sing a closing hymn and a hymn of invitation to give you an opportunity to respond to what we have done, what we have uh, expressed, what we believe. <clears throat>